Welcome to Cardio Radio, a podcast of the Ohio Cardiovascular and Diabetes Health Collaborative, also known as Cardio. This is Dr. Michael Constan from the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, and I serve as the principal investigator for Cardio, a statewide network of Ohio's seven medical schools. Cardio is funded by the Ohio Department of Medicaid and shares best practices to improve cardiovascular health, diabetes outcomes, and to eliminate health disparities in Ohio's Medicaid population. The opinions and recommendations in this podcast are those of the presenters and not those of Cardio and its sponsors, and are not intended to be a substitute for medical advice. I hope you enjoy today's podcast. My name is Dr. Rose Ellen Roche, a professor of primary care at Ohio University's Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine and a member of Cardio's Team Best Practices. In this podcast, we will explore the impact of unhealthy alcohol use on physical health as related to the heart. We will discuss the prevalence of unhealthy alcohol use, share tools to identify risky levels of alcohol consumption during patient encounters, and outline strategies and interventions for reducing alcohol intake. With me today are Dr. Trigva Dolber and Dr. Robert Bales. Dr. Dolber is an assistant professor of psychiatry and internal medicine at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine and interim medical director of addiction recovery services at University Hospitals in Cleveland, Ohio. Dr. Bales is an assistant professor of family medicine at both the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine and Ohio University's Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine. He is lead family physician at South Point Hospital in the Cleveland Clinic Health System. Both doctors are members of Cardio's Team Best Practices. Welcome to you both. I appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise with us. Oh, thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. Happy to be here. I'm excited to have a conversation about this very important topic because this is something that we know as providers and as people. Alcohol is one of the most used substances in America. I'd like to start off with just a few background questions. Dr. Dolber, let's start with you and some thoughts about what you have found in your practice, particularly as an expert on behavioral health and addiction. In your opinion, why is this such a critical topic for primary care physicians to detect and address? Well, unhealthy alcohol use across America is a problem. It's one of the leading causes of preventable death. It's associated with increased isolation and stress. There's also a high level of denial, like 30 to 50 percent of having a problem with drinking or substance use in general, making it difficult to detect as a problem without vigilant screening or a high index of suspicion. That denial makes it difficult as well to engage and discuss around the topic. People can get pretty defensive about it. So as clinicians, we just need to be aware of how our discomfort with those conversations can decrease our vigilance. Dr. Bales, what's the evidence to support these important clinical points? So outside of our known experience with patients, the Department of Health and Human Services Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality states that the problem is unfortunately widespread and dangerous. Not only is unhealthy alcohol use associated with adverse effects on mental and physical health, but it's also our nation's third leading cause of preventable death, and it affects almost one third of adults. Equally among adolescents, drinking and driving is a major cause of injury and death, Global studies have also shown that certain risk factors can make the difference between an increase or decrease in alcohol consumption in the context of increased isolation and stress. Gosh, okay. I didn't know that. Yes. And the COVID-19 pandemic has added to the problem Dr. Dober noted with increased isolation, unemployment, and other stresses contributing to increased alcohol use amongst many who found themselves unemployed or socially isolated. The American Psychology Association notes that 128 studies from 58 countries revealed multiple predictors of increased drinking. These included factors that we may not even think about in an average consultation, such as children at home, income loss, or working remotely. And let's not forget other risk factors that we know of and may screen for, such as mental health factors like depression. Dr. Bills, what does the expression unhealthy alcohol use actually mean? The expression unhealthy alcohol use simply means drinking more than the recommended amount of alcohol. 
It includes exceeding daily or weekly recommended limits in addition to alcohol use disorder, meaning alcohol use and dependence. So it's a good term and it opens up a way for us as providers to discuss alcohol use with patients that may be unthreatening. If you use the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, what we uh, health professionals call the DSM-5, it's useful to keep in mind that they have five different categories, ranging from risky drinking all the way to alcohol use disorder, which is important for clinical and referral purposes. For a reference and a refresher for all of us, according to the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, a drink is considered to be 12 ounces of beer, five ounces of wine, or one and a half ounces of liquor. Healthy adult men ages 21 to 64 should not drink more than four drinks in a single day or more than 14 drinks in a week. Healthy men 65 and older should not drink more than three drinks in a day or more than seven drinks in a week. Healthy adult women of all ages should not drink more than three drinks a day or more than seven drinks in a week. Thanks, Dr. Bales. That's really important information to think about. So when we're reviewing those recommendations, it's really helpful for us as providers to remember and share all that with our patients. But what effect on cardiovascular health, our general well-being for that matter, does unhealthy alcohol use cause? Dr. Dolber, do you have any thoughts? Sure. So regarding alcohol and and heart health, there's a lot out there. It can be confusing to sort it out. On the one hand, we hear about people should be following the Mediterranean diet and they have a little glass of red wine up there. And we wonder if that's heart healthy and it feels controversial. There's been work from Johns Hopkins recently that it's pretty hard to untangle fact from fiction on that. There are a lot of factors that go into sipping a glass of wine uh, and the outcomes on your heart socioeconomic factors impact that, exercise, diet, many others. However, what is clear is that unhealthy amounts of alcohol, which is sometimes referred to as heavy drinking, can lead to poor outcomes for heart health. So unhealthy alcohol intake can lead to issues like high blood pressure, heart failure, and stroke. It can also contribute to cardiomyopathy over time. It can contribute to obesity. Don't forget that. Alcohol is a source of excess calories, with a 5-ounce glass of wine, for example, containing an average of 100 to 150 calories. And then from there, you've got the long list of problems that go along with obesity, including diabetes. More than that, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism notes that unhealthy drinking leads to unintentional injuries, decrease in workplace productivity, and increased aggression and violence. So it's easy to talk about the risks, though, isn't it? You mentioned, Dr. Dolbler's providers, we sometimes receive inaccurate information from patients on their own alcohol consumption, and it can be a touchy subject sometimes to approach with patients, can it? That's right. The American Addiction Centers note that one in five Americans do not accurately report what they drink to healthcare providers. On top of that, they predict half of drinkers would ignore their doctor's advice about cutting back. Even more pressing for us as healthcare providers is that 1 in 10 Americans say they are skeptical of medical professionals when they say alcohol is too much for you. And many ignore the effects of abstaining from alcohol when using certain medications. Mixing alcohol with certain medications can cause nausea, vomiting, headaches, drowsiness, fainting, and loss of coordination. And the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism has a handy list where you can double check which medications can cause harm when taken with alcohol. Yeah, and I want to go back to what you said about ignoring their doctor's advice about cutting back. That's exactly why it's really important that we share this information with patients about why we're asking and and how we can help. Right. Some people want to avoid the feedback, even though we can suspect at times that people are not accurately presenting their intake. Emphasize that drinking in excess may lead to elevated LDL cholesterol and triglycerides. It can impair liver function. It can increase blood pressure and subsequently cause a lot of adverse health problems down the road. And I just want to interject here again and say, you know, in my experience, the denial among those with unhealthy alcohol use, again, like four to five drinks a day, it's all about reaching them and encouraging them to open up about their drinking that really counts. So people can be like, quote, functional alcoholics, and I'm putting that in really heavy quotes, the functional, 
Uh, they'll tell you that things are okay, things are great with their kids, they don't have any DUIs or things like that, but below the surface, things are really unraveling, and they just need to hit a tipping point before they really recognize it. So the question is, how do you make that distinction? Honestly, answers for that are hard. For those of us who work in addiction, by the time we see someone, usually they're already at that point. Um, but it's harder for primary care providers to figure that out in advance. So, Dr. Dolber, any thoughts on that? I mean, building rapport, education, and revisiting it, they all seem to be key. Oh, I mean, yeah, definitely. But also just suspecting it. You know, if you do suspect it, you want to revisit it in a way that doesn't make the patient feel interrogated or judged. And, you know, I realize as I'm saying all this, how hard it is to fit into a primary care visit. Right. But I like the idea that you frame it in the context of cardiovascular or cardiometabolic disease. If I hear someone say that they have five drinks a day and he says, I'm fine, I'm not an alcoholic. But if you reshape the conversation to health, for example, something like saying, did you know the, about the effects it can have on your cardiovascular system? Or did you know the caloric count in each glass of wine you drink per night? And that cutting back may help you lose weight. Yeah, exactly. Then that changes the conversation and makes it a conversation within the context of the primary care appointment. Yeah, I mean, it springboards off the physical problem someone may come to see you for. And then that allows you to enter in discussions on mental health, drinking, and so on. And then from there, even help refocus on what kind of life they have now and how they may see changing that with cutting back on drinking. So, you know, someone comes in with gastrointestinal problem, we shouldn't be putting off the anxiety, the alcohol, and other screens until the very end of our workup algorithm. You know, nine months later, after everything else has failed, we can be doing all that up front. With all these factors in mind, and also taking into account the time constraints we just discussed that many physicians face in the primary care clinic, what's the best way to screen and to assist patients that we might be worried about? Screening tools? I like audit. Mm. Audit. Well, that's unanimous. Those of us who are in practice will remember the CAGE questionnaire for a brief insight in the patient's drinking habits. This includes four critical questions surrounding drinking, and it's still taught in medical schools and nursing schools, and it's used in primary care offices as a brief screen. However, the audit, the Alcohol Use Disorders Identification Test, is a simple and effective method of screening for unhealthy alcohol use defined as risky or hazardous consumption or any alcohol use disorder. This validated screen gets to the heart of hazardous drinking quickly. Based on the data from a multinational World Health Organization collaborative study, the audit has become the world's most widely used alcohol screening instrument since its publication in 1989. It's currently available in 40 languages, and the United States has a preferred version of the questionnaire, the U.S. Audit. Importantly, the U.S. Audit provides a framework for intervention to help those with unhealthy alcohol reduce or cease alcohol consumption, and thereby avoid the harmful consequences of alcohol. The Quality Improvement Program for Medicare and Medicaid has a quick reference guide on this. Oh, that's terrific. You're certainly a wealth of information. We can certainly post that with the podcast description. Can you explain a bit more about what it includes? Yes, so the U.S. audit consists of 10 questions addressing alcohol use, alcohol-dependent symptoms, and alcohol-related problems. By addressing these three domains, the instrument can identify patients who are, one, drinking in excess of recommended levels for healthy adults, two, are already experiencing some symptoms of dependence, and three, may recognize problems relating to their drinking. Scoring the U.S. audit is a simple matter of totaling the numeric scores associated with the patient's responses. Each response is scored using the numbers at the top of each response column. Providers write the number associated with each answer in the column at the right, and then add the numbers in the column to attain a total score. Scores of 7 for women and men age 66 and older, and 8 for men age 65 and younger, begins to entail health risks, as endorsed by the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. So what are the steps, then, for a patient whose U.S. audit results are the range of hazardous to dependent drinking? as that test defines them. What are some of the treatment options? Well, I think actually the higher scores where you have likely alcohol dependence in some ways are more straightforward as your main job is to make a referral. If someone's a high-risk drinker, you can share that with them based on their results. 
Then use whatever techniques you're comfortable with, motivational interviewing, for example, to help them take the next steps to get to an addiction treatment center. What I'll usually tell people I recommend, do one visit with an addiction specialist, even if you don't think you have an addiction, just to get information, get another set of eyes from an expert on what your drinking is like. You can ask them questions, you can understand how your behaviors are relative to other people, so forth. And for you as the PCP, it'll help to be prepared for that conversation if you have a list of local centers you can recommend, and especially helpful if you even know someone there. So, you know, at this point, patients are feeling vulnerable, maybe defensive. It helps if they, uh, if someone that they trust, i.e. you, is recommending someone that you trust. So they might not, at this point, remember, be willing to follow your advice. The important thing is you've planted a seed, and you'll want to revisit that discussion at later appointments. But back to what I was saying before, I think the more difficult treatment plan is the one you have to implement yourself, right? For those patients whose audit scores are in the moderate range, uh, for those, the tool is going to recommend a brief intervention without a referral. So let's step back for a second. What is a brief intervention? This whole time, we've been filling in the details of an evidence-based framework called SBIRT, S-B-I-R-T. That stands for Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment. So what we talked about just now, we talked about screening, which is the audit. We talked about how to make a referral. But what about the middle part, the brief intervention? So that's actually intended to be carried out in a general setting. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, they define brief as 5 to 12 sessions, actually, each lasting 5 to 10 minutes. And those specific behaviors related to risky alcohol use are going to be targeted. So here's where the U.S. audit comes in handy again, because it's already helped you collect a list of the patient's risky behaviors. Then as a primary care provider, you can spend 5 minutes at each of your appointments exploring those behaviors, finding alternative approaches, checking in on progress. It'll become apparent when that's not working and you need to go ahead and refer. So can you give an example of what that intervention might look like? Sure. For example, you might say something like, hey, last time we talked about your use of alcohol and decided that sticking to a limit of two drinks per night was a good plan. How's that been working? And then the patient will tell you, you know, if their goals are being met and they they achieve that, you want to congratulate them, reward that, and work together to see what steps you want to take next. If not, show empathy and ask what might have gotten in the way of reaching that goal. So you'd say something like, okay, so there were a lot of times where you went past two drinks. You mentioned feeling guilty after drinking the last time we spoke. Did you feel guilty in those cases? You know, let's get specific. Think of the last time that happened when you went beyond two drinks. What what made it hard to stop uh, after two? That way you avoid being pushy. You help patients develop their own wisdom and set their own goals. Thanks, Dr. Dober, for that example. And doctors, I have one last question before we're out of time. Any quick thoughts on pharmacotherapies that can be helpful? I can take that one too. Really, you want to think of three medications that can be used to assist patients in decreasing alcohol use and managing cravings. So keep in mind, these meds are going to be used to manage symptoms, but they really should be used in conjunction with behavioral interventions. First one is disulfiram or Antabuse is the brand name. In my experience, it's not used very often. Uh, It makes drinking a really unpleasant experience by making people sick when they use it in conjunction with alcohol. However, it's short-acting, and the efficacy is going to be decreased if the patient chooses not to take it that morning. They can just go ahead and drink at night in that case. The second is acamprosate, or Camprol, which is the brand name. That one you have to take it as two pills three times a day. It's a bit cumbersome, but it does decrease cravings for alcohol. The third medication, and this is the one you probably want to pay more attention to, is naltrexone. It comes in two formulations, an oral and a depo injection. It's an anti-opiate, and it works on central craving mediators in the brain. In my experience, the naltrexone preparations are the most acceptable to patients, and they're effective. Any final thoughts, Dr. Bales? I'd like to end by saying the benefits of being honest and cutting back on your drinking are all positive. It's important to remember for primary care providers, as well as patients who may be listening, the improvements that cessation of drinking can provide. Weight can decrease. Because the liver is quite a tolerant organ, improvements in liver function can happen in just weeks of cutting back or quitting alcohol for hazardous drinkers. Cutting back or reducing reduces the risk of cardiovascular diseases. It helps your heart and blood vessels. It reduces the bad or the LDL cholesterol. Equally, your risk of breast, esophageal, liver, and colorectal cancer is decreased. All of this not mentioning the quality of sleep, 
life balance, and other social factors improve. I think it's important that we end on a positive, encouraging note to everyone to have a look at auditscreen.org and have a look at your own alcohol consumption. Thank you for that, Dr. Bales. I would like to mention that resources mentioned by our guests from the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism and the Quality Improvement Program for Medicare and Medicaid are posted with the podcast description. Other resources on the topics of cardiovascular health are available on the Cardio website, cardio.org. And I'd particularly like to thank our two guests today, Dr. Bales and Dr. Dolber, for sharing their expertise. Thank you for having us. I enjoyed our conversation today. Well, thanks for guiding such an interesting discussion. And a special thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in to Cardio Radio. This concludes today's podcast. Be sure to visit cardio.org to learn more about the Ohio Cardiovascular and Diabetes Health Collaborative.